According to wordreference.com, the Spanish elección means a choice or a decision, which is the same use of the word as election in English. It's just because of educa subversive education, the meaning of the word election has been obfuscated only to mean the choice of certain individuals for various positions and whatnot, rather than a choice in general. But the word still can be used to mean a general choice or decision, and it doesn't have to specifically relate to the so-called voting system. Now, in the context of this video, we should look somewhat at the past history of the United States, and specifically the Civil War, in which the country was divided between two corporate interests, those of the King Cotton industry of the South and the industrialists of the North, such as the railway magnates. And this was intended to divide the country for the benefit of the corporate heads of the time and foreign interests where it was promised essentially to the corporate interests that they would become the rulers of the Americas, but they were tricked. Such a thing is explained in the Civil War, a narrative by Shelby Foote, which can be found in three volumes on the uh, Audible app. And it re it's read by Grover Gardner. Evidence of this can be found in number 492 in the Supreme Court of the United States, October term 1916, Certiorari to the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, Oregon and California Railroad Company, a corporation at all defendants and appellants, versus United States of America, appellee. Brief for defendants and appellants, Oregon and California Railroad Company, Southern Pacific Company, and Stephen T. Gage individually and as trustee. And, of course, the trust mentioned here is the Union Trust Company. This case, or statement, this case, the Oregon Land Grant case, is now here for the second time. It came here for the first time from the Circuit Court of Appeals for the... In continuation, the decree, however, is not the last word. On June 9, 1916, Congress passed the Ferris Act, forfeiting the railroad's title to the granted lands. It is true the harsh word forfeited is not employed, revested is the term used. The title is declared to be revested in the United States. Even a mere naked trust or power to dispose of the lands in the manner specified in the Granting Act and to apply the same to the use and purpose therein described is denied the railroad. So here we just get uh, an example, but it's very clear the, the writer is showing a in in the in the words used and the tone of this paragraph it is apparent that the writer is representing a, a sort of a bitterness towards a original promise that was made to them and likely to the uh, cotton industry in the south as well in which they would basically be lords of the land if they sell out the country and once they sold out the country, obviously, there was no one to defend them when the people who had promised it simply took back what they promised. That, anyway, appears to be what the case is here, because clearly um, this, uh, the, the writer is showing that sort of bitterness where they were promised something and then it was taken back. But it was taken back, and there's essentially nothing they could do about it, because if you look into this, that all that land was indeed quote unquote, revested. The grantee's estate. We venture to think, however, that we are the owners of this land by right, and as of absolute grant, qualified only by these provisos and by nothing else, and that as such owners, we are entitled to the timber upon our granted land and entitled as well to take the coal or the iron, for example, that we may find below the surface. This grant was not a gift. It passed to the railroad company upon full and ample consideration. The adventurers who obtained the charter and who accepted it, to use the language of this court, 
in Plat V UPRR Co. 99 US 48 undertook to construct and maintain the public work. Their undertaking is the consideration of the grant and without legislative consent, they cannot throw off the obligation they have assumed. Nor, we will add, can the grantor without consent of the railroad company repudiate the grant which it made. The granting act in question here includes special considerations and onerous obligations as against the railroad company. It requires the grantee to transport the mails and to transmit the dispatches of the government preferentially in point of service and at reasonable rates not to exceed those paid by private parties and it obligates the grantee for all time to the transportation free of charge of the troops and property of the United States. The government holds to the railroad company a very important relation namely that of contract. The grantees cannot throw off the obligation they have assumed. It would be passing strange if the government should now maintain that the company has no right to the timber upon these lands because, and although for many years before coal was used as fuel, it burned this timber and its engines without question. And the right to use that timber, whether to burn it as fuel or to use it in the upkeep and maintenance of the railroad, is in the forefront of the Act of Congress itself. For that Act granted the lands to secure safe and speedy transportation of mails, troops, munitions of war, and public stores over the lines of said railroad. There could be no such transportation begun or kept up without a railroad. A railroad constructed not only but also maintained and without fuel for motive power. Would the use of that timber to help pay the construction debt be in contravention of the railroad policy of the Act? Would the removal of that timber go in defeat of the settlement policy of the Act? Would it not be primarily and directly in aid of such policy? For it is obvious enough that without a clarion most of the land is unfit for settlement. See, they essentially were granted land, and they took that grant, and as always, they construed it, or they, what is the word they like to use all the time? They interpreted it to mean that it is now their private property. That's what's going on here. That's because it was clearly promised to them in that manner, and then it was taken back because the service that these entities were to conduct being destroy the country and leave it open for foreign intervention forces and control, well, they had already completed that, very apparently. The grant in the Schulenberg case was made not in the first instance to the railroad company, but directly to the state of Wisconsin. The fee simple title of the state was qualified by a restraint on the grantee's power to alienate the state, to quote the language of this court, by the terms of the grants from Congress possessed no authority to dispose of the lands beyond 120 sections, except as the road in aid of which the grants were made was constructed. Conveyances were to be made by the state of the granted lands from time to time as sections of the road should be constructed. No constructed section to be less than 20 consecutive miles, in the event that the road should not be completed within 10 years, no further sales shall be made and the lands unsold shall revert to the United States, said this court. The power of disposal and the provision for the lands reverting both imply that the first section in terms declares that a grant is made. That is, that the title is transferred to the state. It is true that the route of the railroad for the construction of which the grant was made was yet to be designated and until such designation the title did not attach to any specific tracts of land. The title passed to the sections to be afterwards located. When the route was fixed, their location became certain, and the title, which was previously imperfect, acquired precision and became attached to the land. The provision in the Granting Act that all lands remaining unsold after 10 years should revert to the United States if the road be not then completed is no more than a provision that the grant shall be void if a condition subsequent be not performed. Touching the restraint upon the power of the state to alienate the granted lands, this court said, the prohibition against further sales if the road be not completed within the period prescribed adds nothing to the force of the provision. A cessation of sales in that event is applied in the condition that the lands shall then revert. If the condition be not enforced, the power to sell continues as before its breach, limited only by the objects of the grant and the manner of sale prescribed in the act. Land ordinarily comprehends not only the surface, but also the timber growing on it and minerals beneath it. Washburn says, land is always regarded as real property, and ordinarily whatever is erected or growing upon it, as well as whatever is contained within it or beneath its surface, such as minerals and the like, upon the principle that 
cujus est solum, uhus est usque ed coelum, in one direction, and usque ad orcum in the other. They always do this where they do use words and they don't translate them even though they could because they're being um, sophisticated. In Higgins Oil and Fuel Company at all, v. Snow at all, Circuit Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, it was contended that a life tenant of land was not entitled to any interest in the oil produced therefrom. Her estate being limited to the surface. Answering this, the court said, The life estate is given, not in the surface of the land, but in the land as land. And it is elementary that the land itself, in legal contemplation, extends from the sky to the depths. Land includes earth, waters, and every natural condition, including minerals and growing trees. The restrictive provisos, therefore, apply with equal force to the timber and minerals as to the surface of the ground. Now, what's interesting about this right here is that by that line of thinking, the supreme law of the land would actually apply to the high seas as well. So that is an interesting implication that they probably did not think about when they were rendering that uh, judgment because they are judges, right? <clears throat> uh, violation of the Constitution, of course. Now we move on to the real object of this video, which is whose vote really matters and that would, of course, depend on who really is the government, practically speaking and operationally. Who actually, what is the law that is enforced? And that, by and large today, are codes. Municipal codes, building codes, state codes, and, of course, the U.S. code. All of these are codes. Those are what are enforced, not the Constitution. So, the only real vote that matters is about who makes the code and who votes for the code makers. So, here we look at the International Code Council, bylaws for the International Code Council Incorporated, a Delaware nonprofit, nonstop corporation, effective December 10th, 2021. Now, notice that name right there. Don't be fooled by the fact that it is a quote unquote Delaware nonprofit. It is not domestic, it is international. Anyway, Article 1, Name and Objectives. This organization shall be known as the International Code Council Incorporated, here and after in those bylaws referred to as the Council or the Corporation. General Purposes. The Council is not a profit, non stock corporation, is not organized for the private gain of any person. The Corporation is organized exclusively as an organization described in Section blah blah blah. And I don't really care about any of that. And I'm sure nobody else does. So let's go ahead and look at the implications in this document. Article 2, Membership. Categories of Membership. The Council shall have the following categories of voting membership. A governmental member shall be a governmental unit, department, or agency engaged in the administration, formulation, implementation, or enforcement of laws, ordinance, rules, or regulations relating to the public health, safety, and welfare. Each governmental member shall designate its primary representative who will receive benefits of membership in the council on behalf of the governmental member as determined by the board of directors from time to time. So, a governmental member is a voting member. So that basically means that this entity that makes these, these codes, right, the members that vote on it will be governmental agencies. And it does not stipulate that those governmental, governmental agencies have to be domestic or U.S. domestic, right? They could be governmental agencies from Myanmar, Thailand, or more than likely Switzerland. And they can set it up in any way, and naturally the voting members could determine who else gets to be a voting member. So let's say you had all voting members from Europe, and they just decide we don't want to accept anyone else. They could do that because this is a corporate structure, private corporate structure, mind you, despite their stupid designations. Governmental member voting representatives. Each governmental member shall exercise its right to vote through its designated governmental member voting representatives and shall be entitled to the number of governmental member voting representatives as specified in Table 2.111. Governmental member voting representatives shall be designated writing by the governmental member and shall be employees or officials of the governmental member or departments of the governmental member provided that each of the designated voting representatives shall be an employee or a public official actively engaged either for or part-time in the administration, formulation, implementation, or enforcement of laws, ordinances, rules, or regulations relating to the public health, safety, and welfare. 
designation of a governmental member voting representative may be changed by a governmental member writing from time to time. And that would be a good drinking game uh, for the word governmental voting member or governmental member. Yeah. Boy, said that a bunch of times. So here we have that table, right? Uh, zero to 50,000 population as a voting representative of four and, uh, well, so on and so forth. Over 150,000 is 12. Anyway, honorary member, an individual who has rendered outstanding service to the council and whose name shall be proposed by the board of directors and confirmed by a majority vote of the voting members as defined in Article 3 of these bylaws and annual business meeting. Non-voting categories. The board of directors shall establish the non-voting categories of membership as may be necessary for the adequate representation of all parties interested in association with the International Code Council. Non-voting categories shall provide for membership for individuals and corporate entities and shall include but not necessarily be limited to employees of governmental units, design professionals, corporations, educational institutes, not-for-profit associations, and other individuals interested in the purposes and objectives of the council. Well, that would be a nice list to have. <laughs> Classification by the classification by the board of directors. All applications for membership shall be subject to classification by an approval of the board of directors. Applicants shall be eligible for membership on approval of membership application by the board and on timely payment of such dues and fees as the board may fix from time to time. This authority may be delegated by the board of directors to the chief executive officer. The annual dues for each membership category shall be established by the board of directors. In no case shall a person be considered in good standing or be qualified to exercise membership participation or entitled to receive any privilege of membership who is in default of payment of dues for three months, except as may be extended by the board of directors. Now, don't you love that? Contrary to the Constitution, these are the people that actually make the enforced laws throughout the United States. And I would say in most countries around the world. And it's literally a pay-to-play scheme where you have to pay them in order to have a vote on what happens, and people from around the globe can vote on what laws are passed in your country. That is by far the most direct example of, well, that's ma in many different ways, it's a violation of the Constitution, but it, the U.S. Constitution, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's also a violation of, of pretty much every concept of sovereignty that has ever existed throughout history. It's, it's taking away the ability to choose from everyone. But not only that, it's actually tar charging a fee to the individuals who want to try and determine what the, the laws will be enforced. And it's, it's a pretty amazing scheme, honestly, especially considering they've managed to get away with it for so long. Termination of membership in the council shall terminate on occurrence of any of the following events. Resignation of the member, expiration of the period of membership unless the membership is renewed on the renewal, renewal terms fixed by the board. Member's failure to pay dues, fees, or assessments is set forth by the board after they are due and payable. Any event that renders the member ineligible for membership or failure to satisfy membership qualifications. Non-liability of members. A member of the corporation shall not be personally liable solely because of membership for debts, obligations, or liabilities of the corporation. Article 3, Voting Members. Only governmental voting representatives and honorary members collectively as the voting members shall have the right to vote on any matters under these bylaws, including but not limited to the right exercised through those individuals eligible to, to vote for the election of director or directors, or on a disposition of all substantially or substantially all the assets or on a dissolution of any on or on any changes to the articles of incorporation or the bylaws. Only the voting members shall be permitted to make motions and to vote on any issue at the annual business meeting, special meetings, or and written consents. Voting by proxy is not permitted. Any person de design, uh, designated as a governmental voting member, governmental member voting representative of more than one governmental member, or who is also an honorary member, shall be entitled to only one vote. Wow, that's that's some interesting wording. But basically, that last part's just saying if they're an honorary member and a governmental member, then they can only have one vote instead of two. Article 4. Geographical Representation Limitations 
To encourage wide geographical representation, no more than two governmental member voting representatives designated by governmental members located in the same state may serve simultaneously on any one committee, nor more than two governmental member voting representatives design designated by the governmental members located in the same state serve simultaneously on the board of directors. To provide for geographical representation on the board of directors, the following sections are established. Section A is Alaska, Nevada, Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, Col British Columbia. Section B, well, it has all those states. Well, yeah, basically it's just a breakdown of what states go into which section. Interestingly, though, Section C also includes Mexico, not just any of the, because it says Utah, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and Mexico. So, no, it's not New Mexico, it is Mexico, Mexico, as in the entire country of Mexico is located under their Section C. Article 10, Code Development Process. The Board of Directors shall adopt a policy which may be amended from time to time on the Code Development Process for the International Codes. And there you go. The, the voting members determine who the Board of Directors are and what they'll do. And then the Board of Directors determine what codes are going to be written. And then those are enforced at your local level, as everybody will find throughout zoning codes, municipal building codes, maintenance codes, um, Ohio Revised Code, the Oregon Revised Code, the U.S. Code, the all of these different codes, right, from the International Code Council, intellectual property and all that. Article 12, Chapters. Organization, the Council shall encourage and recognize the establishment of regional, state, student, professional, local, area, and international chapter organization of its members, purpose of which shall be the furtherance of the objectives of the Council, Applications for the establishment of a chapter together with a copy of the proposed chapter bylaws and list of those who have agreed to become members of the chapter shall be submitted to the Board of Directors for approval. Chapters shall be established upon approval by the Board of Directors. Management. All chapters shall be managed in accordance with policies established by the Board of Directors. So there you go. They have their claws in everything or tentacles. Probably be better as a analogy. Article 17, Rules of Order. Robert's Rules of Order shall govern all aspects, aspects of parliamentary nature unless otherwise provided by the Board of Directors. Now, the only reason why I reference this is because I have seen Robert's Rules of Order in many places, such as the bylaws or the government documents for the Knights of Columbus and other organizations. Finally, we have history. The original ICC bylaws were approved on July 24, 2002. Seven amendments were presented by, to the ICC membership at the ABM on September 27, 2004. The amendments were approved and ratified by letter ballot sent to all governmental members. The result of the election were certified by the ICC president on December 19, 2004 and became effective on December 29, 2004. One amendment was presented to the ICC membership at the ABM on September 27, 2005. The amendment was approved and ratified by letter ballot sent to all governmental members. The result of the election were certified by the ICC president on January 3, 2006 and became effective on January 13, 2006. Two amendments were presented to the ICC membership at the ABM on September 2006. The amendment was approved and ratified by letter ballot sent to all governmental members. The results of the election were certified by the ICC president on April 5th, 2007 and became blah, blah, blah. So, the, yeah, these are all just dates of elections and when they were, quote, unquote, certified by the president of the ICC. <laughs> we cut to the International Electoral Standards Guidelines for Reviewing the Legal Framework of Elections. This publication originated as a set of regional guidelines applicable to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, region, jointly developed by International IDEA and the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, ODIHR, of OSC, OSCE in Warsaw, which was published in 2001. The OSCE publication provided the basis for further developing these International IDEA guidelines, and the Institute is grateful to the ODIHR for their continued cooperation and contribution contribution to this global work. Now, most of these entities and organizations are usually controlled by the same people. 
And so this is all just basically glad handing or, uh, you know, the um, dog wagging the or the tail wagging the dog or whatever that saying is, because they they create this facade of so many entities. But when you get when you dig through all of these entities, you usually find out that they lead back to the same individuals uh, or, or individuals in the same locations and connected to the same things and whatnot. Anyway, copyright International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, International IDEA 2002, all rights reserved, so intellectual property. International IDEA encourages the dissemination of its work and will give permission properly for reproduction or translation. This is an international IDEA publication. International IDEA's publications are not a reflection of a specific national or political interest. Well, I would say that's not true. Views expressed in the publication do not necessarily represent the views of International IDEA's board or council members. Publication can also be found at blah, blah, blah. And Design Holmberg and Holmberg Design AB, printed and bound by Bulls, Trickery, Homestead, Sweden. And it states applications for permission to reproduce any of this publication should be made to the Publications Office of International ID, ASE 10334, Stockholm, Sweden. Preface. International IDA seeks to promote sustainable democracy around the world and has consequently laid much emphasis on supporting efficient and sustainable electoral processes. Again, election meaning choice. So they support efficient and sustainable choice processes. Translate that a little bit into language that uh, those of a certain education pedigree would be uh, would be easier to understand or comprehend. IDEA has in this context worked on clarifying, defining, and promoting internationally recognized standards in the election field. The Institute has published three codes, again, election meaning choice, of conduct covering election administration, election observation, and political parties campaigning in democratic elections and guidelines for external involvement in election observation. So yeah, Meddling in sovereign choice, basically, which is a very nasty thing to do. Anyway, this book sets out internationally recognized standards applicable across a range of areas of electoral legislation. This, we hope, will be useful for those engaged in reviewing existing legal frameworks for elections or formulating new electoral legislation. So yeah, basically helpful to the people whose job it is to propagate this crap. These standards are intended to be used as benchmarks to assess whether or not an election is free and fair. Of course, that would be according to their interpretation of that. And they, you know, never interpret things for their own benefit. No, they, they wouldn't do that. It's just, you know, trust the science, right? While IDEA's earlier codes of conduct set... Now, the basic procedural principles underlying the election process, e.g. how to observe elections, these guidelines are more substantial, setting out what should be the actual content of election process, what to observe in an election. These guidelines will fulfill a long-felt need in the electoral field. I hope they will be useful not only to professionals in the field, but, also, but to all those concerned to see good electoral practice across the world. Karen Fogg, Secretary General, International IDA. Don't you just love that name and that stupid title? That's that's something else. These people are are, are re they're really something else, aren't they? Briefly, the legal framework will include the following sources, each with an intended degree of flexibility for amendment. Now, notice the first one that they stipulate here is Constitution. Now, <clears throat> their perspective obviously here is to obfuscate what a Constitution actually actually is, which is it's a constituting activity for something, right? So you constitute something, meaning you create it or form it. And the U.S. Constitution is the United States forming document. And the reason why they repeat this word continuously and obfuscate its definition to be, quote, a governmental document and all of these other stupid labels that they add to it, so that people don't really understand what a constitution is. Anything can have a constitution because all it is, it's just the constituting activity or action of something, constituting something. 
And generally speaking, these people will attempt to marginalize, diminish, and they hold a strong contempt toward a particular constitution. And most things are written in reference to that constitution, the supreme law of the land, which they want to do everything in their power to recognize it as anything but the supreme law of the land. So they put this first. And they say it is more difficult to amend requiring debate and decisions, often with special majorities or special procedures. So that first line, more difficult to amend, that's coming from a negative standpoint because they don't like it. And then if you read down into these other ones, types of legislation, formal authority and flexibility, well, you know exactly where they stand. They want things to be in the hands of a few individuals that govern the world and think they know better than everyone else. And they want it to be out of the hands of the people and especially out of the hands of anything but a singular centralized sovereign. Use and merit of the written law. Other governments are free to develop their legal frameworks. There is a need for written law as opposed to customary law or administrative policies to govern elections. Written law provides the benefits of certainty, visibility, and transparency. It is more readily subject to judicial interpretation and review and is more useful to interested parties, including electors. Now, <clears throat> some things that we should know about this is that they right here are attempting to divide writing from custom and practice and tradition because it's easier for them to control rather than the fact that written law goes in line with custom and practice and tradition right so they're trying to divide those two things one second they state although governments are free to develop their legal frameworks essentially meaning there's a but right so they don't like sovereignty clearly constitutional provisions a written constitution as the basis of a country's governmental structure should provide the foundation for key elements of its electoral framework. As constitutional amendments are often subject to a qualified majority vote or other comparable onerous processes. Notice that word there, onerous. That is the same word that was used in the previous document that we're looking at. The constitution's electoral provisions should only contain fundamental electoral rights and the basic principles of the electoral system. These should include the following, the right to vote and to be elected, the institutions subject to democratic elections and their terms of office, the composition of any non-elected institutions, and the body or agency to be entrusted with the conduct of elections. It may also be appropriate to include the essential elements of the electoral system to be used, as constitutions are generally more complicated and time-consuming to amend. Constitutional provisions should not go beyond describing the very basics of electoral rights and the electoral system. In order to allow for necessary flexibility, provisions related to the management of elections should be incorporated into parliamentary legislation and administrative and procedural matters should be left to administrative rules and regulations to be issued by subsidiary bodies, including through instructions and directives of the EMBs. What they are talking about here is that a constitution, specifically the U.S. Constitution, not just any, but that one in particular, was written in a way to make it difficult to be changed. They don't like that. They want flexibility for themselves because they're a centralized empire seeking to control the entire globe. And that is the reason the U.S. Constitution is a problem for them. As they stipulated here, it is, they recognize a problem and it always has been. And it was designed to be a problem for them. And they have in no place stated that these things were not actually designed for the very things that they say are drawbacks, because in fact they are problems for them. Not so much for us though. Election legislation and codes of conduct. In addition to formal election legislation, other relevant electoral instructions may also be contained in the informal codes of conduct agreed among various political parties and generally overseen by the EMB. In some countries, such codes play an important role than others. They may relate to a number of aspects of elections, such as for the rules of behavior for political parties and candidates during the electoral campaign, the conduct of the ruling government party to prevent it from having an undue advantage over the other parties, or the self-regulation of the media. Sometimes a co 
yeah, isn't that funny word there? Self-regulation. <laughs> Sometimes a code of conduct contains a set of normative ethical principles for practical applications in the field, such as code of conduct for electoral observers or for AMB staff engaged in the conduct of elections. Legal status of such codes varies between jurisdictions, as do the consequences of breaches of them. Informal codes of conduct should also be reviewed with view to checking their conformity with internationally recognized standards. The legal framework may sometimes set out the procedures and mechanisms to be used when dealing with complaints and disputes arising from violations of a code of conduct. Such provisions will obviously differ from country to country, both in detail and in content and may affect how a code of conduct is enforced. For example, a country's legal framework may provide for adjudication or media. Our next document deals directly with this issue that we saw prior, what we would see as an issue, but in fact, they would see this as an issue towards their power, their sovereign power over us. So in this context, we have international conglomerates, and they seek to control the globe and to remove the sovereign choice, otherwise known as an election, from the people of those places and vest them or put them into the hands of the international conglomerate, which is mostly located in Switzerland and Rome. So this executive order here directly identifies and prohibits exactly what we looked at previously and what previously had gone unchecked and unchallenged throughout the United States, if not across the globe. It is definitely being challenged now, however, and in some cases being challenged. This is the Executive Order 13848, imposing certain sanctions in the event of foreign interference in a United States election. And remember, election means to choose. By the authority vested in me as president of the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, including the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEEPA, the National Emergencies Act, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the United States Code, which, again, is technically speaking, intellectual, intellectual property of the International Code Council. And the only real authority that matters in this context is the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, being the Constitution as the supreme law of the land. I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, find that the ability of persons located in whole or in substantial part outside the United States to interfere in or undermine public confidence in United States elections, including through the unauthorized accessing of election and campaign infrastructure or the covert distribution of propaganda and disinformation, constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. Notice that word there, constitutes being used in a different context to the U.S. Constitution, meaning an action to uh, create or form something, in this case, the threat to national security and foreign policy, and that election and campaign infrastructure wording right there relates directly to the document that we just read. Although there has been no evidence of a foreign power altering the outcome or vote tabulation in any United States election, haha, <laughs> there's quite a lot of evidence for that, like we just read. Foreign powers have historically sought to exploit America's free and open political system. In recent years, the proliferation of digital devices and internet-based communications has created significant vulnerabilities and magnified the scope and intensity of threat of foreign interference, as illustrated in the 2017 Intelligence Community Assessment. I hereby declare a national emergency to deal with this threat. Accordingly, I hereby order. Section 2A. All property and interests in property that are in the United States that hereafter come within the United States, or that are or hereafter come within the possession or control of any United States person of the following persons are blocked and may not be transferred, paid, exported, withdrawn, or otherwise dealt in, any foreign person determined by the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Secretary of State and the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security. To have directly or indirectly engaged in, sponsored, concealed, or otherwise been complicit in foreign interference in a United States election. Or again, election meaning choice, not necessarily just the quote-unquote presidential election. To have materially assisted, sponsored, or provided financial material or technological support for or goods or services to or in support of any activity described in subsection AI 
of this section or any person whose property interests in property are blocked pursuant to this order or to be owned or controlled or to have it acted or purported to act for or on behalf of directly or indirectly any person whose property or interests in property are blocked pursuant to this order. B, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury, in consultation with the heads of other appropriate agencies, notice that word right there, appropriate agencies, shall jointly prepare a recommendation for the President as to whether additional sanctions against foreign persons may be appropriate in response to the identified foreign interference and in light of the evaluation in the report mandated by Section 1B of this order, including, as appropriate and consistent with applicable law, proposed sanctions with respect to the largest business entities licensed or domiciled in a country whose government authorized, directed, sponsored, or supported election interference, including at least one entity from each of the following sectors, financial services, defense, energy, technology, and transportation, or if inapplicable to that country's largest business entities, sectors of comparable strategic significance to that foreign government, i.e. the entities that were just uh, covered in this video. The recommendation shall include an assessment of the effect of the recommended sanctions on the economic and national security interests of the United States and its allies, any recommended sanctions shall be appropriately calibrated to the scope of the foreign interference identified and may include one or more of the following with respect to each targeted foreign person. Blocking and prohibiting all transactions in a person's property and interests and property subject to United States jurisdiction. Export license restrictions under any statute or re regulation that requires a prior review and approval of the United States government as a condition for the export or re-export of goods and services. Prohibitions on United States financial institutions making loans or providing credit to a person. <laughs> Restrictions on transactions in foreign exchange in which a person has any interest. Prohibitions on transfers or credit of payments between financial institutions or by, through, or to any financial institution for the benefit of a person. Prohibitions on United States persons investing in or purchasing equity or debt of a person. Exclusion of a person's alien corporation, corporate officers from the United States. Imposition on a person's aliens, principal, executive officers of any of the sanctions described in this section or any other means authorized by law. Now, any other means authorized by law would include the death penalty, especially when you're talking about child trafficking, kidnapping, and uh, <coughs> threat of force or use of force, attempted use of force or otherwise such as attempts to kill and stuff. But those are, of course, wording in the code, and the U.S. Constitution only makes a stipulation not cruel or unusual. Now, notice the exclusion of a person's alien corporate officers from the United States. That's where you're talking about, like, bar card holders and other foreign representatives that are working against the domestic interests of the nation within the United States. And there's quite a lot of them. But it does require the state of mind, but also the evidence and whatnot. But this executive order provides the uh, pretext, anyway, for the practical acquisition and enforced taking of the alleged property of these international entities like the International Code Council and all of these other people that meddle in domestic choice and the sovereignty of the United States Constitution. And there's obviously many other implications as well. But this does provide at least a legal vehicle for which the country can be taken back from, quote-unquote, foreign investors and or stakeholders. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content that I have published, including my books and uh artwork and other things like that. Also, there are free books available at the link, and if you so choose, you may support my work at Cash App or buy me a coffee. Thank you.